Hello and welcome to the 11th Craft and Cook Show. Made it up the hill to mum and dad's and um, as you can see, we've got a beautiful Australian themed garden and I hope that some of their green thumb stuff has um, brushed off on me. I get to find out a little bit more in a couple of years when I get back to my own house and garden. But they are pedigrees in terms of Australian native plants. Starting uh, with some other people, the Montrose Environmental Group back in the 70s, we're big advocates of promoting, protecting and growing Australian plants. And of course now I get to play down at the beautiful Australian Botanic Gardens with some of the same people I used to know back then when I was about five or six years old. But on top of doing native plants, mum and dad do a beautiful perennial gardens and through their life they've had lots of different farms and properties where they've done everything from lemon orchards, berries, they've been dairy farmers, cash agricultural crops and always, always mum has had a beautiful native perennial and herb garden. So I'm going to do what I always love to do when I first get down here is have a quick walk around the garden with mum and dad. Uh, I think mum's here today so we'll get together with her and have a look at some of the things that are in flower at the moment and then we'll get on with our project. Now we better get serious about today's show and there's two things we're going to do. We're going to have a look at appliqueing banksia flowers and also mum and I are going to make a berry semolina cake together. I'm letting her do the horrible bit which is lining the cake tin and then I'll jump in later and do the easy bit. But first of all let's have a look at the project. Now I made one to show you earlier, in fact 10 years earlier. So this is one that I did a long time ago that was an entry for a quilt exhibition down in Tasmania. And I constantly lose this quilt because it's so small, it's only A4 page size. But it was a great one, I thought, to use as an example to show you how to make your own Banksia flowers or ruched flowers. And it gives us a combination of two things that we've done before. So the last Craft and Cook show, we were at Leanne's and we talked about rolled over needle term stems. And I'm going to do some of those today. And then way back in show number three, if you want to have a look, we talked about ruched flowers. So the combination of those are going to work for me today. I'm doing two different pieces. One of them is portrait this way and the other one is going to be landscape and they're both with Banksias. I found in the warehouse um, some of these canvases, I think we use them for an, a trade show exhibition or something to display uh, maybe some fabrics on and I thought these would be great so I'm actually going to do mine quilted but then I'm going to overlay them over the canvases for our exhibition next year. So this is one that I have done a good part of first that I can show you. So have a look at this one, I'll lay that out. Now, see the cool background fabric? This is an ombre, but it's a really weird one because it's got this dark band in the middle going through up to medium to light grey. And when it has sat on the bolt, it even looks stranger, but I think once you start using it, it's a fantastic fabric for you to be able to overlay your applique onto and create some real vocal points and features. So that's what I'm going to use and you can see I've got my stems on here that I've needle turned on and then we're going to add in some of these spiky leaves. So let's have a look at the other one. I'm not going to give you the flower yet, let's put that aside, I want you to see it. So let's go to this one and it's going to run this way. So I've started the stems on this one, you can see, and I've got another one here tacked on, ready to sew for you now. When we talked last time uh, with these particular rolled over stems, I talked about putting your fabric right side down 
and then flipping it over and needle turning it under so you're using the first side almost like a bit of a ledge. I'm not going to do that with these because um, I've cheated a bit and I have ironed down one side and I've tacked it on. I want my stems on this particular piece to be a little bit flatter so use this technique if you just want a really fine flat stem if you want to create really gnarly padded, gnarly padded ones, maybe even putting a piece of string or twine in between, then use the one we did last time where you're flipping it over to create the stem. These are going to be nice and flat and that's important to me because the 3D leaves that we're doing are going to be quite flat and I want the real focal point to be the 3D Banksia flower. So I'm going to grab my needle and thread and needle turn this last bit down to show you and then we can do some of our leaves. See that? I've started needle turning the other side down and once I've completed doing all of this strip I'll be able to take out my little tacking stitches and my stem will be done like the ones on the portrait one. You can also see here I've got this funny little shape. What this is going to be is um, representative of a banksia flower after it's finished flowering and you've just got the centre cone from the banksia left over. So I'm going to layer up two different colours for this one and you'll get to see a shot of that maybe in a couple of weeks when I've finished it. Let's go back to the other one for a minute and have another look here. Now, see all of these spiky leaves? Banksias are a real problem, a real challenge I should say, not a problem, when you want to applique them because most of them have really spiky, intricate leaves and I just picked this one out of Mum's garden to show you as well. See that? How are you supposed to needle turn that? Really, really hard to do. So I'm not even going to try. If it was blown up maybe to 10 times as big, I'd have a crack. But at this size and even smaller on our wall hanging, I think raw edge applique is going to be the best way to go. There's going to be lots and lots of photos on the internet that you can have a look at of Banksias. I treasure this book. This is my little reference book that I have from Celia Rossa, and she's a beautiful botanical painter. So when I go through this book, it's got lots and lots of different species of Banksias in it. But you can see all of them have really spiky, intricate leaves. So what I decided to do was use a couple of batiks that are nice, tight uh, thread count. So there's a couple here. There you go. So these are really lovely and they've got that lovely mottled pattern to them so they've got nice movement. I've used two different colours. I've got a dark one and a light one. And these are light enough that they are really going to pop well on my background. So you can see I've added a few in light and darks together so that they give a really nice effect of maybe the light shining them on, on a dark afternoon on this grey. To do these which is this, it is quite easy to do and I don't want you to even think or contemplate doing a template for them. What I want you to do is just freehand draw them and I know that's a big ask but let me show you, I just grab my ruler. If I uh, perhaps measure up how long I want my leaf to be, so let's have a look at this one, he's about three and a half inches long. So if I come over to my paperback adhesive, and I'm using uh, Steam Seam 2 today, which has got that extra layer on it that you can peel off. And this has got the sticky side on it. So the side with the grid is the side I'm going to draw on. So if I draw, draw myself a line that is about three and a half inches long, and I'm going to draw a stem from here to here. And it's just gonna be one line 
but I'm going to pop a little bit of a curve on it because it's really nice to have some of your leaves with a bit of a curve so that you get some movement. Then it's a case of winging it. So you're going to come up a little curve and in a bit. Up curve, in a bit. Just like this. So there's no need for a template. And then we'll go up the other side, curve outwards and then V in a little bit, curve outwards and in. I wouldn't say that the Banksia that I'm doing today is any particular one, but it is just a, a generic shape that represents a few of the different tall Banksias, just like that. So any time that you want them to be a certain length, if I wanted a short one, I'd go up two inches and I can curve it in either direction. Remembering it's going to end up facing the opposite way once you've ended up adhering onto your fabric. Like that. It's really quick and easy to do. And they don't need to be that difficult. And you could have a look at lots of different ones uh, on the internet or in books or even in the garden. Bring some leaves in, take some photos at the botanic gardens and get yourself a reference of the sort of shape you're looking for. And then you'll just be able to draw them up nice and quick like that. When you do these sort of leaves, just like with any uh, applique that you're sticking down, try and group your leaves or your shapes in particular collections that are all going to come from the same fabric. And that way you're not having to cut little individual leaves out. You can stick them en masse onto your fabric. So if I had three or four drawn up onto this piece, I would be able to lay out my green and just stick, peel off the backing on here and just stick the whole piece on mass onto my fabric on the wrong side like that and then I would be able to iron it all on in one go and then cut them out in front of a good Netflix or something and then they're ready to put on. So I've got some spare ones here just to show you. Uh, when you're cutting these out you're going to need some nice medium sized or small scissors that have a really nice sharp point and please remember as well that save perhaps one of these pairs of scissors just for doing this sort of cutting out because you are cutting out fabric and paper together and it is going to accelerate how quickly your scissors blunt over time because you're going through the paper as well. So let's have a look at how we're going to embellish our leaves. With this type of really fine raw edge applique, you've got a couple of options. One is to top stitch down the sides of the leaves with a thread or a monopoly thread so it doesn't show. For me, these are going to be hanging on a wall or there will be a wall hanging quilt or onto the canvas as I plan. So I'm not worried about too much wear and tear. So I'm, I'm also not too precious about having to secure down the edges. Instead, what I'm going to do is a little bit of detail to hold them on, but to add a, bit of, a little bit of interest, some stitches. So if you have a look at these two down here, these have already got some stitches on them that I've done with a really lovely variegated pearlized thread. And it is a Y stitch. So that's what I'm going to use for the rest of them as well. It's really fun to try out different stitches for this type of work. And I had never thought about using a Y stitch, but I was watching Margaret on the Australian Sewing Community uh, Facebook page yesterday and she was doing really lovely traditional uh, Y stitches in a circle that were all perfect sized and all going together and I thought I'm going to use that stitch but mine are all going to be all over the place and different shapes but it does work quite well. Can you see that? I think you can just see that. So it's just adding in little veins to the leaves and it's going to hold them down as well. I'll do a couple more on this side and then I'll do one of the dark ones to show you. You could also use you know, a really nice fine stem stitch if you're doing it by hand, um, just even a straight stitch or a back stitch, whatever, whatever takes your fancy. I'm going to move across to this for now just to show you as well one of them on the dark leaf. So I'm doing a straight stitch first just for the top of the leaf and then we're going to do a Y stitch. So I've gone up into one of the little spiky leaves to come up. I'm going to hold my 
thread down into a Y like that, go up into one of the other sides or points. When you bring it back down, you'll end up with a little U shape like that and you'll bring your needle up on the upside of that U and secure down the U shape or the V shape on the bottom side like that. So I think that's going to look quite nice. It's not going to detract too much from the overall effect of the leaves but just add a little bit of detail and also a practical element to hold down the leaf. Now before we get to the flowers I think we better get the cake in the oven because um, mum's doing the whole thing on her own so let's go and do that. Okay, we're in the kitchen. Mum weighed everything out for me and I've started mixing everything together. This is a semolina berry cake. One of the lovely ingredients that we put into this one is rich creamy yogurt and I'm using a Greek yogurt today. So we'll just pop this in. Um, you'll need about 250 grams. So this one had 500 in the top so I've added a half and I've just had a look. I've actually probably not got half so I'm just going to take a little bit more and pop it in. The other thing that I've got in here is one and a half cups of super fine semolina. So it's a semolina based cake not a flour one and there are fine and coarse semolinas on the market. Make sure you get the fine one. If you can't find it with the flour in the cooking section in the supermarket head down to the health food aisle because it's often down there instead. I've also popped in three quarters of a cup of caster sugar and also two teaspoons of baking powder and you can see it really is just going to be a melt and mix cake. I'm going to pop in a good two teaspoons of vanilla as well. If you wanted to use a raspberry flavour instead you could but I like it with the vanilla. That's all coming together okay and then the last thing that we're going to add in for the actual cake mix is melted butter. And you can see here mine's just melted. I've got a little bit of a softened lump in the middle but that's done and we're going to add 185 grams of melted butter. I know I've talked about this before but make sure your butter is cooled down a little bit before you add it in. You give this all a really good mix around and it is quite a wet mix when it goes into the pan so it will pour in. You've got one more ingredient to add into here and that's going to be two cups of mixed berries. Of course you can use fresh fruit. Um, Mum and Dad's raspberries and strawberries are just starting to come on now so in about a month's time down here I'd be able to make them with all fresh berries. But for today I'm going to use frozen ones. And these are good for two reasons as well because they're solid when I put them into the mix and therefore they're not going to break down too much when they go into the mix and into the cake tin so they'll stay in really nice shape. Of course the other great thing is they're in the freezer. So all the ingredients for this recipe you can have in the fridge or the freezer ready to go at short notice. So these little packs are about two cups. We don't have to be precious about the exact amount. So I'm going to give this all a really good stir through. And of course some of the colour is going to come out of the berries which is going to give the cake a beautiful colour as well. And that's it. Really easy to do. So we're going to pop all of this into our cake tin. Mum has very kindly lined the base of this cake tin for me beautifully in the right shape in a circle and you know what I did with the tea cake the other week. You could probably get away with that too. Just have a big piece in there but this one's going to have a nice shape. We use anything from a 20 centimetre to a 23 centimetre cake tin or an 8 to a 9 inch one. I'm just going to mix a couple of that around, just give it a little bit, not too much, just a little bit of a press down on the top, see that there. Then 
One thing that mum loves to do that I always forget is to put some flaked almonds on top and it just adds a nice finish to the cake and a little bit of a crunch on top. So she's got these out ready for me. So we'll sprinkle these on. There you go. They don't need to be toasted first. In fact, what will happen is, is they will toast as they are cooking in the oven. So that is our recipe all done. She's telling me in the background I have to press them more. Okay, now we're done. And we're going to pop it in the oven. Uh, we're going to give this quite a long time. This is going to have 45 minutes at 180 degrees. And then we'll see what it's like with a couple later. While the cake's in the oven, let's go back and have a look at these banksias. But this time, let's do the flowers, which are really going to be the showcase of the piece. And these are my little flowers. You see that? So you've got three uh, ruched strips. So go back and have a look at the technique that we did in show number three to create these. I've done straight rows of ruching and they're really little. So while last time I think we did two and a half inch ones or two inch ones, this time I've just cut strips that are only an inch wide on the bias and have a look at the fabric. See this? It's actually an orange and it's got swirls over the top of it. So as a fabric on its own, it doesn't look like a banksia, but when we ruche it all up into these little flowers, it just gives us all lots of different shades of orange and yellow together, which is going to be really nice. So when I pop this on later, that's how he's going to look on my work. So with these one inch strips, I've actually folded them over as we did in show number three. And now they're only half an inch wide because we started with one inch ones. And this means that also, instead of marking them up at bigger one inch intervals, you're only going to mark them at half inch intervals to get a classic ruche. If you want to mess around with this, please have a go. You might like to have a go at just doing one inch divisions down it and that's going to give you quite a different look to your ruching. And that may actually suit what you are doing. Let's have a look here. So I'm going to just do a couple of rows for you so you can see. Remember what I said last time too, don't make your stitches too small and you want to set your stitches up so that you have a loop of thread that goes over all of the folds and that's going to pull up your ruche nice and tight for you. Kate. The first lady that I taught this to was French and she could roll her eyes. It was really nice. I can't even do it anymore. The cake is awesome. Bryony from Canberra. She's French. Yes. It already smells lovely. Does it smell good? Yeah. There you go. So you can see it's just going to be teeny weeny little ruches. To set these up so they're going to sit really nice in the flour, um, I've done what we did last time too. I've tacked them onto a scrap piece of fabric, but obviously not in a circle this time. It's a long rectangular piece, and I have given it a little bit more stability. And you can see it's quite firm. On the back underneath, there is a piece of iron-on stabilizer. So I've used a scrap piece of fabric like we've done in the past. This was a rectangle of the darker batik that we used for the stems. And then I've just popped on a long narrow rectangle of this adhesive and then I've been able to pull the edges of my scrap piece of batik over and that has got it all concealed on the back now and it's nice and firm for the front. So I will just be able to sew that Banksia head en masse onto my leaves. Now two excuses for not having sewn this on yet. Uh, the first one is I haven't finished embroidering my leaves and I need to do that first because the flower sits over the top of them. But the second thing is, is that really I should machine quilt or hand quilt this whole piece before I pop my Banksia head on. Otherwise it's going to be hard for me to get up underneath and close to the edges of the flower. So have a think about that when you're setting up the order that you're going to do things in. If I bring you back to this one that I showed you before, this has a much larger flower on it and I did four rows of the ruching for this one. If you get much larger as well, 
uh, you'll find that you'll be able to slip some extra padding underneath if you want to. So you can actually have some extra pallet or batting under there to almost give it a curved domed top. But again here you can see I've added a lot of detail in to the piece with my quilting. There's the shadow of a Banksia flower here and the leaves are all done in a pale green or yellow and then I've added some cream pebbles and things to the background. So that all needs to happen before you pop those flowers on. So just stop and have a think about how you wish to embellish your work and what's best to do before you add those final 3D details onto it. So I hope that's given you a little bit of an idea of what you can do with one of our classic favourite flowers in Australia, the Banksia. Obviously you can then take that and do so many different things with it. Lavender spears are a great one, sheaths of wheat, wisteria, there's lots of different flowers that you can do. For me, once I've finished this one, I think I might have a go at one of those uh, Banksia men's eyes and they've got the lovely fluffy tops on them and then they've got a collar of uh, petals underneath that could also be done with the ruching. And of course, I love using uh, ruching for the top of Waratah flowers as well. And we'll come back to those in one of our next shows. So I think it's time we went and saw what this cake is like that's smelling really good in the oven and have a cuppa and then we can finish off for the day. Cake's out of the oven. We're ready for afternoon tea. So I just thought I'd give you a quick look. There we go. So you can see the flaked almonds on the top have toasted up really nicely. And it's still nice and warm. Let's see how it cuts through. Because it is still warm, those berries are super soft. Mum and I have been debating about what I said before. If you should have your berries frozen or whether you should have them um, fresh or defrosted. So what I think the scoop is, is that you've got great big chunky berries like I did today, the whole strawberries. You might want to defrost them first. The main difference is the cake will still be fine, but it just takes a little bit longer to cook. So we're really ready to try this out. There you go. So I hope you enjoyed the recipe. If you want to try something different as well and you don't want to use mixed berries, the fresh mangoes are just coming into season now and they would be super to use in the cake. And as I said before, I use, chose a plain yogurt, so I used a Greek yogurt today. But if you want to use one of those lovely flavoured fruit yogurts, you can do that as well. Alright, so please enjoy and I look forward to seeing you next week.